Hello, everybody. I hope everybody's having a good Thursday out there. I am trying to get along myself. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit more about systems and how the Earth interacts. All right. So uh, last time I showed you a video about the wolves, how we took out the um, keystone species, the primary predator of the ecosystem, and it caused Yellowstone to start collapsing or definitely changing. I, you know, it didn't really collapse per se, but it was not the same Yellowstone as we once knew uh, due to the removal of the wolf. Then we put it back in, and lo and behold, the wolf actually uh, uh, changed everything again, even the flow of the rivers. So you saw how everything was connected. And in Yellowstone, it's all over the place. It's just not in Yellowstone. It's in every single forest. Everything is connected out there in the world. And this is one of my favorite videos. You know, I'll say a couple times in this uh, during this class that, and this is just my opinion. You're allowed to have your opinion, okay? I can't prove this, but I think uh, plants are smart, right? Uh, they don't overeat. Uh, they, you know, <laughs> they just enjoy their lives, and. These, this video talks about a, a lady, Susan. Um, you can watch her TED Talk, too. It's an amazing uh, story. Uh, talks about how trees, she figured out that trees actually like talk to each other. They send uh, different radioisotopes down their trunk through the uh, uh, fungus that grows in the soil. It's like a little web internet down there, back up to the other trees. And there's mother trees and there's, you know, hub trees. I mean, it's just amazing. That she figured this all out. And you too. You know, this is science. Okay. This is not, you know, some lady just talking about, hey, trees talk. You too can do this experiment. All right. You can go out to the Canadian forest and put a bag over a couple of different trees and put some radioisotopes up in there and see if they get transferred over to the other tree. All right. And then to get your results and go tell her if you found out the same thing. Because other people have already found out the same thing. And this is just an amazing video. Of how um, you never know what's really underneath your feet when you're walking through the forest so, uh, or woods. So next time you go, just go walk through the forest. I want you to, you know, think about this little little movie here, this little video. And just a quick aside, this Eco Asia right here, all right? Once again, this is from Sustainable Human, uh, but this is just a take from her uh, bigger videos. Um, Eco Asia here. This is a search engine. Uh, for the internet and you can get this little app, you know, and, and search the internet on equation just like you do the Google and every time you do a search guess what they do they plant a couple trees Right the search engine that helps plant trees All you got to do is do your searches there instead of Google. It takes a while to get used to I'm still not I use it on my phone and I use it on my iPad all the time, but I, I still don't use it on uh, My computer. I don't know why I haven't changed, but I don't use this computer much. I just actually just started using it and it's my son's computer. I just use my uh, uh, iPad and phone, and um, I got a little uh, Chromebook, I guess I should say. Um, so, uh, if, think about it. Check it out. They do good searches, okay? You get the same kind of info. The internet's all open to all. So, let's watch this little video and keep your mind open about how big this world really is and what's really out there that we need to pay attention to, okay? Good music on this one too. Do, 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 do. Imagine you're walking through a forest. I'm guessing you're thinking of a collection of trees, but a forest is much more than what you see. <clears throat> Underground, there is this other world, a world of infinite biological pathways that connect trees and allow the forest to behave as though it's a single organism. Mycorrhiza literally means fungus root. They're the mushrooms. The mushrooms are fungal threads that form a mycelium, and where the fungal cells interact with the root cells, there's a trade of carbon for nutrients. The web is so dense that there can be hundreds of kilometers of mycelium. See a rich on that, I'm telling you. That mycelium connects different individuals not only of the same species, but between species. We have found that mother trees nurture their young. A mother tree can be connected to hundreds of other trees. 
other trees will send their excess carbon through the mycorrhizal network to the understory seedlings. They even reduce their own root competition to make elbow room for their kids. What? They're not getting a bigger McMansion? Are injured or dying. They also send messages of wisdom onto the next generation of seedlings. So we use isotope tracing to trace carbon moving from an injured mother tree down her trunk into the mycorrhizal network and into her neighboring seedlings. Not only carbon, but also defense signals. Through back and forth conversations, they increase the resilience of the whole community. That's because there are many hub trees and many overlapping networks. So trees talk. But they're also vulnerable, not only to natural disturbances, like bark beetles that preferentially attack big old trees, but hybrid logging and clear-cut logging. You see, you can take out one or two hub trees, but there comes a tipping point. Because hub trees are not unlike rivets in an airplane. You can take out one or two and a plane still flies, but you take out one too many, or maybe that one holding on the wings, and the whole system collapses. Just like taking out the wolf. The disturbance at this scale is known to affect hydrological cycles, degrade wildlife habitat, and emit greenhouse gases back to the atmosphere, which creates more disturbance and more tree diebacks. We need to save our old growth forests. These are the repositories of genes and mother trees and mycorrhizal networks. We need to re-establish local involvement in our own forests. When we do cut, we need to save the mother trees and networks so they can pass their wisdom onto the next generation of trees. We need to regenerate our forests with a diversity of species and genotypes <coughs> and structures allowing natural regeneration. We have to give Mother Nature the tools she needs to use her intelligence to self-heal. And we need to remember that forests aren't competing with each other, they're super cooperators. Super cooperators. Yeah, I love how she says that. They're super cooperators, you know, and they're sharing all this information. And she talked about how they share with the other trees too. survival of the fittest. Remember I said that last time, survival of the fittest. It's talked about three times in that book and in, in the origins of species. But love and cooperation is talked about over 100 times. This cooperation goes on the trees, too, right? I'm telling you, trees are smart. <laughs> that's just me though okay you don't have to believe me on that one please don't all right but that's just so interesting to have that she was able to use science and she set up this experiment and you too can set up the same experiment by just putting these kind of bags over these trees and then putting the radioisotopes in there and seeing if they would suck it up and transfer it over to the other the other trees and those are those radioisotope isotopes can be uh, traced because each one has a certain signature it's like you have your own little DNA. You know, each person's a little bit different. Each one of those isotopes can be traced. It's just an amazing, amazing thing uh, to think that, that underneath our feet when we're walking around in the forest that uh, there's an interwebs in there. There's, a, you know, an internet underneath our feet of mushrooms. You know, those mushrooms just connecting all these trees so that they can pass all these uh, molecules, all those pieces of matter across uh, the webs. It just, uh, it blows my mind, all right, to think about some of that stuff, all right? It really does make me go, whoa. All right, so let us get into the slide presentation here and continue about uh, the ecology and some more basic um, environmental science uh, stuff here, okay? So or ecology and the organism. So ecology is a study of the interactions among organisms, and within their environment, which includes many different levels, right? Uh, so you have an organism, which is a single species, and a population, which is the group of all the same species, okay? 
just like you would have, uh, you know, the freshmen, the seniors, and uh, juniors, and soft, soft, freshmen, sophomores, seniors, and juniors, and seniors. And you would have also, they so could be one big class, too. All the turtles could be one big population, too, or all the students, okay? A community includes all the populations of the species that live and interact within an area. So an ecological a community ecologist studies these interactions. So the community is all these things. It's the sea turtles, it's the fish, it's the amoebas, it's uh, uh, Dory and uh, Nemo out there. Okay, so that will be the all the community. An ecosystem includes community and all the uh, and abiotic and non or non living parts of the environment. So when we take talk about an ecosystem we've got to include the wind the rain uh, the sunlight uh, the heat uh, the topography all the different things all the minerals and rocks as well okay so the ecosystem includes everything with inside that defined area remember it has to be a defined area to have any of these things you have to have a fine, defined area to define how big your community is and you take out all the animals inside that community and down to the uh, population of a certain species of that community, okay? And ecosystems, everything. The biosphere is the sum total of all living things in habitat and habitats on Earth. So when we talk and say that someone says the biosphere, that's the whole Earth. That's just this big, huge rock that's uh, floating around. Well, we think it's huge. It's actually like a Speck of dust when you think about it, and in the universe size, right? So we're just this rock that's floating through the uh, universe. Landscape ecology examines how those ecosystems, communities, and populations are distributed across the earth. So we look at the different segments. We, we're looking down, and we're saying, okay, this little area looks a little bit de deserty, so we're going to call that the desert. We're looking over here. This looks really rainy and green. We're going to call that the... Um, tropical rainforest okay this looks all white we're going to call that the tundra okay so that's what a landscape ecologist does it separates these the biosphere into studyable units okay and defines certain areas each organism has a relationship with its habitat and the environment which it lives in so the rocks the soil the leaf litter the plant life etc all go along with why an animal lives on where they live, all right? Depending on the species, a habitat might be a square meter of soil or many, mile, many miles of land, okay? So, um, like, uh, elephants are considered an umbrella species. They go all over the place. They, they have a large range to, uh, to walk. Uh, but yet the ants... When they have their little communities, they are not going too far away from their ant nest. Okay, organisms thrive in certain habitats, not in others, creating patterns and habitat uses. And we can see this when we uh, examine the the way everything works around us. Uh, so, mobile organisms are able, of course, to choose where they live in a process called habitat selection. Okay. Uh, plants and don't have that uh, ability to really choose where to live, but um, they still have their limits of where they can be put. All right. An organism role in a community is called a niche. Okay, and I've always wondered what my uh, humanity's niche is here in uh, the world. I'm still working on trying to define that one. Um, my best guess is to uh, maybe burn carbon. Okay, I think that might be our niche, is to burn carbon. I had no idea, but uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out. But we're smart. We have the intelligence to do a lot more than other animals. Uh, but a niche would be just like the wolf was the top predator in uh, Yellowstone National Park. Okay, that was his niche. And we'll talk about some other animals that have niches later. Uh, species with narrow niches are called specialists. Um, so there's there's... One certain, I have no idea how to pronounce this bird's name, but its specialist is digging the grubs out of the trees. And it actually helps the trees survive by getting those grubs out. Okay, Species that can utilize a wider range of resources. This is the only food for uh, this, this bird. But 
most animals uh, have a wider variety of resources, and they are called use a wider variety of resources. And they're called generalists. And we're generalists. Humans are generalists, right? The bear is a generalist. They eat berries and uh, animals and fish. Um, and you can think of another specialist would be the uh, panda bear, right? So the panda bear only eats uh, bamboo, okay? Uh, population size is the number of organisms in an area at a given time. It will grow when the resources are abundant and the natural enemies are few. So a new species will move into an, an area and their population will grow as long as the temperature and the precipitation is okay for them to live there and they got enough food and all that other stuff. If they have no predators, it will start expanding its population. All right. Uh, declines are usually caused by resource loss. So once that animal gets to a certain uh, population size and the food starts going away, you'll see that uh, J curve of the population eventually turn into an S curve. And their, state, their uh, population will stabilize. All right? But declines are uh, due to resource loss. But uh, there's other things like natural disasters and, that uh, impact the species. All right? Uh, so there could be a, a major flood, and if that population doesn't have a big enough size, uh, it could be wiped out, okay? Uh, or we can just overhunt them and cause them to go extinct like we did with the northern uh, passenger pigeon. Um, it went into extinction due to overhunting. I mean, there used to be millions and millions of uh, these northern uh, American passenger pigeons. They would, they would just litter the sky. We would just go out there and bang away. Right, and we banged away a little bit too much, and they didn't have a big enough population size to reproduce to bring their population back. All right, um, and they finally just died away. It was a sad, sad day. It's kind of like the buffalo, but we didn't do it all the way for the buffalo. I don't know if you guys remember me seeing any of those pictures of Buffalo Bill, right? And all those buffalo, they used to just shoot right in front of the uh, railroads, right? Um, that came very definitely very close to the fate of the passenger pigeon the buffalo did. Uh, we caught that in time. <clears throat> so population density describes the number of individuals uh, per unit area. Right? Population distribution describes the spatial arrangements of the organisms within that area. So population density. Density describes the number of individuals, and population distribution describes the spatial arrangements, right? In spatial arrangements, we got all different kinds. We got random, the trees, just the flowers are just all over the place, right? Uh, we have uniform, where the uh, population, and at least I don't know how these pigments figure it out, but they know where their eggs are, right? And then we got clumps, so we got a little area over here, a little area over here, a little area over here. You can see it's also like in schools of fish, they're clumped. All right, flocks of birds are clumped as well, okay? I don't know, what do you think uh, humans are? Are we random, uniform, or clumped? It's our population, random, uniform, or clumped? I don't know, I think we're like all three, okay? We got the guy out there that's, you know, living out in the woods all by himself, all right? Yeah, we got the uniform, we look at our suburbs and our cities, all right, our clumped. I guess our suburbs are more like our cities, though. Our suburbs are more like the clumped. No rain in this, but our cities are like nice and orderly, right? First and Second Street, North and South, right? And then our suburbs, we'll just put a suburb over here, golf course over there, right? I think we're all three, okay? Sex ratio is a proportion of male to females. It's usually a one to one ratio, or seen. I mean, a monogamous species. Uh, ratios varies in others, though, but it's typically a one-to-one -one ratio, okay? An age structure describes the number of individuals in different ages within a population. Uh, this can help predict uh, whether our population will grow or shrink in the near future. So, because if you got a lot of old people, not a lot of young people, uh, your population is probably going to shrink real quick, right? But if you've got a lot of young people that can start having an offspring uh, pretty soon, uh, your population, not a lot of old people, your population is probably going to grow, uh, have a big burst in the future years, okay? And our population in the United States is kind of, we have a lot of old people and not as many young people, okay? So our population is due to, to shrink, um, and it actually is, 
Okay, if you look at our regular population growth rate of the United States and don't take in any immigrants, we are at a zero population growth right now. Okay, uh, so if we didn't have those immigrants coming in every single year, we would have a negative population growth. And we're not the only developed country that's like this. I mean, England's like a lot of you know Europe, a lot of European countries are like this. I think Australia is the same way. It just happens. It just uh, you know, just a natural way of a population growing. Uh, whether you're a moose or a human, you move into one little area and then you come to, you get your care capacity and you work it out. Population change is determined by four factors, though. The natality, uh, the birth within the populations, the mortality, the deaths within the populations, the immigration, how many people immigrate in here, and also immigration, how many people actually leave uh, or animals leave from that biome they were coming from, once come from all right so a population rate of natural increase is determined by subtracting this is the death rate uh from the birth rate so if you took our natural uh increase here in the united states from our natural born citizens birth rate and death rate we would be at zero population growth and if it wasn't for the immigration right um we would have a negative population growth now, immigration, I don't think anybody wants to leave the United States. We're number one, right? So, we're not, no one wants to leave. Okay, You might want to kick a couple people out of that, but we don't need to do that either. Okay? Everybody's welcome here in the United States. That's why they call us the melting pot. Okay? So, populations may grow and shrink and all remain stable. So, the actual population growth rate includes the effects of immigration and immigration now. So, we've got to really look at it in the whole spectrum of things. Uh, you got to look at the birth rate minus the death rate, but the immigration rate minus the immigration rate. And that gives us a total population growth. And that's what you're going to see when you uh, look at almost every single uh, city or uh, state or any population statistics on humans. You always get this uh, total population growth, right? Okay. Rates may be expressed in, uh, per 1,000 individuals per year. Uh, these can be used in the formula. So we like to use it as per 1,000, so we shrink down the numbers. That's about it. Okay. And growth rates may express as a percentage of population growth um, as 100%. Population growth times 100. So we can get, we usually, it's like 5% population growth. I think in the United States, we have about 1 point, or 2.5 or 2.3 population growth rate. I'll get you the real stat when we get into the population section, all right? But it's usually uh, expressed as a percentage, okay? So when population increases by a thick percentage each year, it undergoes what's called exponential growth, okay? And when we graph it, we see the typical J curve, all right? And this J curve pops up all the time. This is the exponential function. This is what that book, that uh, video was all about right here. It was all about this J curve. And this J curve can uh, keep on going forever, folks. All right? I like to see them. All right? There, I mean, I don't like to see them. I like to see them in my stock portfolio. Okay? Because that means my stocks are I'm making some money. Right? But I also know that that can't happen for too long. I mean, I own Tesla and that thing just took off. And I'm like, I'm waiting for it to crash. You know, it took some gains and I actually bought a put against it. So, I, I think it's got to go down because it's unsustainable. These these J curves are unsustainable. So when a exponential growth only occurs when nature, when a population is small, competitive is competition is minimal, and environmental conditions are ideal. So it, it really does, you know you have to have ideal conditions for this to happen, and then sooner or later Mother Nature will take over and turn it into a S curve, which we'll see next. All right. So you know the COVID. When I was correcting a lot of your uh, papers, I talked about, you know, the, one of the questions is, uh, do you think uh, the population understands what uh, Dr. Bartlett was talking about you know, on the exponential growth? And I think the COVID uh, problem here really brought this J-curve to people's attention once more. Uh, I think we might have forgot about it already, right? But it's still out there. And remember, when I first started, it was a big old J-curve, and they wanted to bend the curve, right? They wanted to try to flatten the curve, because we would go through this normal J-curve, because this was a new 
pathogen in our society that had we had no defense against. All right, it was just able to run wild. As long as it found a human to prey upon, it was doing good, right? And we had had no no defense. I mean, had, we had no defense. I had no predators, right? We had no competition, all right? And in my environmental conditions were ideal, right? And the population was small at the beginning, right? And then it just totally took off. But eventually, whatever every population is constrained by its physical, chemical, biological limiting factors in the environment. So, you know, this J-curve cannot last forever. And we're in a J-curve, we'll learn in a population site section, and it can't last forever either. All right, what normally happens is we have this J-curve start, and then it bends into the S-curve, all right? And the population stabilizes. Um, and this is just a normal part of uh, everything else and it, because it stabilizes because the resources um, available can there's only so much room for them to eat there's only so much food out there to share between everybody the temperatures um, might be different they can't go out to different um, areas and move to grow their population as a bird or whatever because the temperatures may be too extreme might be too cold or too warm here you know humans were good about that we can build our little houses or whatever so we've been really able to expand our populations okay but we still only have so many places we could grow our food to feed all you know 7.6 billion people here on this earth okay predators and parasites will also come into the population all right so once we start getting all these little animals you know there are a bunch of bunnies up there that's going to attract some of those uh coyotes to come and get some meals, and then they'll start a little pack, and they'll have plenty of rabbits to eat, and they'll have a new population, and that will condense the uh, population size, it's like a negative feedback loop. The, the predators now come in and stabilize the system, okay? And also disease will happen. If you have an overpopulated site and a lot of people together, you're going to get sick, all right? Just think about, you know, strep throat in the dorms. Right, everybody's nice and healthy when they're at home, and over the summertime they come into the campus, get to the dorms, and pack them at dorms. Everybody's getting strep throat. Okay, not that I want you guys to get strep throat. So you know, yes, growth. You know, I you'll hear me. You know, think I don't like growth. Growth isn't because I kind of bash on it. I just think we gotta turn it over to the S curve. But growth is a necessary. Uh, condition for any population to be able to survive all right we need to have a they need to have a viable population size to keep their species going okay but sooner or later that has to flatten out due to the limiting factors out there okay there's the laws of physics exist for everything okay and then eventually what will eventually happen is s curve will go down and end up like that bell curve that they talk about in that video Okay, so everything really is a, just a bell curve, right? Because sooner or later the sun will stop shining and all these little birds and yes, us humans, unless we go to Mars or another galaxy or something, will be gone as well, right? Good thing that's not in two way, uh, 12 billion years or whatever, right? So limiting factors restrain the growth of any population. You know, humans' limiting factor is just our intelligence. Okay, getting off this earth. Okay, but we have the earth as all our resources. So the Eurasian collared dove is a non-native species that has reached carrying capacity in Florida where it was introduced. All right, so it was brought over from Eurasia into Florida. In other areas, its population grows slowly or exponentially depending on how it recently it, how recently it arrived. So after it got here in, the, in Florida, it made its way all over the world, all over the United States, you should say. But you see these different SJ curves, all right? It depends on where it was. So in the western United States, the dove has arrived recently and is still undergoing its exponential growth. So it just finally migrated all the way out there, and you can see its exponential growth happening there. In the eastern United States, the dove's population is, is growth is slowing. All right, so it's turning into that S curve on the top, okay? And in Florida, it's already has, 
uh, hit and see it probably hit overshoot right here in the beginning of its, you know its population the first burst all right population then crashed all right came back up came down came back up came down again and it was just like I said there will never be a you know the, the perfect gets curve will just the population will just up and down at a certain level okay and that's what happens in nature okay the density of the population can enhance or diminish the effects of some limiting factors. So it depends how many how packed in that population is. So density dependent factors rise when rise and fall when the population uh, with the population density. So predation, or like I said, that the rabbits, there's a lot of rabbits that will bring in the predators and the wolf packs to or coyote packs to get some good uh, food. All right. That will cause the population to crash or to to diminish, or disease will pass throughout all those uh, animals. Density independent factors are unaffected by population density. So these are something like uh, egregious acts of nature, right? Temperature extremes, or a uh, meteor, or a volcano, a flood, or a hurricane, or something—something something that's out of control of the population's um, doing. Okay. Carrying capacity uh, can change, and this—all this stuff is known as, as carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is basically the inverse of the ecological footprint. All right, so we've been learning a lot about the ecological footprint in your uh, homework assignments. And that is how much land one person consumes to live their lifestyle, right? Carrying capacity is basically the inverse of that. It gives you the late, you take a certain area of land and you say how much can that produce, all right, before you even get in there, all right? So it's just how much can that uh, land produce for withdrawal okay so carrying capacity can vary in environments and species are complex and ever-changing so carrying capacity is not a fixed number all right just like i said the s curve comes up right here and this is like carrying capacity is just the top of this line this s curve but the population goes around that top of that s curve right but carrying capacity if you really think about it since the second law of thermodynamics uh we can't Create or destroy, change nature. We can't create or destroy nature, or create or we cannot create or destroy matter, right? And then every time we use energy, we got a little bit less energy to use. So carrying capacity kind of should be an S curve. And remember, it's a bell curve at the very end, so it will always be declining at some point as long as there's some withdrawal coming from here, right? And making that bell curve, right, it might be look really slow and not really, you know, there, but it is over millions of years. It's going to show up, right? And you'll be able to visualize it then, okay? Right? But it's actually going on. So carrying capacity is always changing. It's never constant. And if a fire destroys a forest, its carrying capacity for most animals will decrease. But by learning how to build shelters and control fires, humans ease the limiting factors of cold environments, increase the planet's carrying capacity for us, right? So like I said, not all birds are able to go down to the tropics or, or even up into the tundra. But we're able to go down to the tropics and into the tundra. We, we, we have a brain. Or well, they got brains too, but we have this sort of some crazy intelligence stuff that we're able to do. So we're able to build these houses and build all the shelters and expand our population and live where we would normally not be able to live. Right? Human development and resources um, extraction are speeding the natural rate of environmental change that affects our populations. Uh, so we talked about the extinction and the biggest problem with uh, the next mass extinction that we are seeing today is habitat destruction. All right. And that's due to our human development. All right. And getting out those resources. So we actually do a thing called mountaintop removal to get our coal. We go down there in the, the wild hills of West Virginia, wild and wonderful West Virginia, and we blow off the tops of the mountains. We are not going to be able to get that habitat back 
So those birds that once lived there can live there again. All right, it's going to be a totally different ecology. It's going to be a totally different biome. All that topography is now gone. It's just a little flat thing. All right, we'll talk a little bit more about mountaintop removal and some of the how we re re or extract our resources and what that does to the environment uh, later on in this class. But human development and, and resource extraction is speeding up the natural rate of environmental change and the effects of populations of all different species. All right. And increasing ours. One example is introduced species which displace or kill native uh, natives kill native species. All right. So one of the things that we we have trouble with is that we introduce what's called invasive species. And we'll talk a little bit more about these later on in the class. But invasive species is a species that was not originally there and has no uh, competition and it's an ideal place for them to live, plenty of food, and their um, population just grows exponentially. It takes off on that J curve. All right. And then all of a sudden, some of the native species now have a new competition that they are uh, losing to, and the native species start dwindling. Okay. And they start getting killed or die off. So a wide variety of organizations work to protect the lands and remove alien species to restore native habitats. You can go down to Florida and you know go boast constrictor hunting if you want because they don't belong down there in the Everglades. And you can get paid handsomely to go do some bow constriction hunting out there in the swamps if you want. All right? uh, but it's very, very tough to be able to do this. All right? uh, there's this one fish called, uh, I think it's, I can't remember the name of it. It's real mean. It just really eats a lot. And they actually have had to drain out the ponds and lakes or ponds that the fish is found in because the homeowners would just dump it out in there from their aquarium into the lake. And next thing you know, it took off. And they would have to kill off all the fish, drain out everything, and fill it back up. Right? Make sure everything was all dead. Crazy. Very expensive and very hard to do once we introduce these and don't catch it in time. The, these efforts can create uh, economic benefits as visitors are drawn to wildlife and natural resources. But once we do it, all right, we can actually uh, help out the environment and make it into what's called ecotourism. All right, it's one of my favorite, favorite things to do, um, it, you know, for a, a country to do or to try to expand on. When I think about jobs, jobs, jobs. And uh, the Green New Deal, uh, helping out with ecotourism is definitely uh, a way to go. And we'll talk a little bit more about ecotourism later on in this class as well. But a wise economy takes in about $12 billion annually uh, from more than 7 million visitors per year. So they get a lot of people that come down onto these coral reefs. And to go on to Hawaii, you're not allowed to take any fruits, and you can't take any fruits out of there either. All right, because they don't want any bugs coming in, any pests that they can't get. Um, they got these little cute little beagles, all right, that are there. Their primary job is to smell for tree snakes. So when new uh, ant food comes on on board onto the onto the uh, land, they put out these beagles and they look for tree snakes, all right, because tree snakes will kill all the birds. And there's some uh, we'll learn about the Apaco Islands where all the birds are actually disappeared because of the tree snakes. And Hawaii does not want that happening to them. So climate change poses a challenge, too, um, when it comes to uh, habitat law or extinction. So as the temperatures and rainfall patterns change, even protected areas, must, uh, um, areas may be affected. So we can't stop these protected areas. Uh, from the temperature change or global climate change. We might be able to stop the polluters and all the other things, but we can't chop Mother Nature from getting any hotter. we we got to stop what we're doing to do that. We'll talk about that in the next chapter. The mountainous uh, forest in Hawaii is protected and experiences the increased range of malaria-carrying mosquitoes. All right, so what has happened is since the, it's gotten hotter in these mountainous areas, all right, due to climate change, these malaria-carrying mosquitoes are now in that area, and hence everybody's getting malaria. All right, you can see that happening with uh, the Zika virus. I don't know if you guys heard about that uh, phase. Um, 
and it was a scare a while ago. I haven't heard too much about it lately. Uh, but the mosquitoes from South America were working their way up here to the United States, all right, because it's getting a little bit warmer, all right? We have a pine forest in North Carolina that is dying out because of these boars, these um, pine these beetles that eat the pine, all right? And they were always there, all right? But every year, it would get cold enough where their population would die off, all right? And then during the winter, during the winter time, the population down there in the south would do their thing and then fly up north and eat and then die off. Okay, and it happened for generation after generation. It was just the way it was. The temperatures would always kill these bugs off. They would always population would be too big down in one area and move up for more food because of the competition. Right, the population was just spreading out its wings like most. And animals do. They come up north and start eating the pine trees, but then we get cold and the whole population would die off. But now, guess what? Those those beetles are not dying off during the winter time, and the forest is getting decimated. Okay, and those beetles are now moving forward, even moving further up north. All right, because the temperatures are getting warmer. Right, these little subtle temperatures, and you know, people think about the change in temperatures, and we don't think about it too much. All right, but just think about your human body if your temperature is raised by one or two degrees, you're getting sick, right? And if it goes down, you're getting sick too, right? That's not a good thing. So, just a little slight change in your temperature, um, you don't feel too good. And just imagine those little slight changes in temperature on those little tiny bugs or the seeds. Most seeds germinate at a certain temperature. And sometimes, like that lettuce, if it's not a good, nice temperature for lettuce to grow, you're not going to have good lettuce. All right? It's got to be a nice, cool spring. If we don't have any spring, we don't have any good lettuce. Okay? Scientists and managers will need to come up with uh, new ways of, to save these declining uh, populations due to climate change. And I don't know what we're going to do. We're just going to have to change our ways as humans. All right. So that is the end of chapter. What was this? Chapter three. All right. So we got uh, chapter four. We got next. And then we'll start getting into climate change. All right. And then we'll guard, get into economics, my favorite part. And then we'll talk about agriculture, renewable energies, energies, all this other good stuff. Okay? So I'm always done with the sciencey stuff. So one more thing about sciencey stuff, and then we'll start getting into some of what's happening in today's world. All right? So if you guys have any questions, uh, let me know, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks.